Pastor, I couldn't find the other pulpit, so I just grabbed what I could find. So I have no idea where it went. But anyways, uh, how many of you appreciate Pastor Weaver? There is none like him, right? How many pastors in the middle of the time of prayer would tell a 90-year-old lady that, you know what, I'm going to show this video (laughs) at your funeral. That doesn't happen, but that's why we love Pastor Weaver, because he is himself, right? He is genuine, filled with the Spirit, loves Jesus, and loves his church. So anyways, good to see you guys tonight. How many of you got a good afternoon nap, a Sunday afternoon nap? Yeah, how many of you wished you got a Sunday afternoon nap? Okay, well, I'll be quick so you can go home and go to sleep then, those of you that raise your hand. But uh, we're in a series titled Things Jesus Never Said, and I was thinking part of the reason we wanted to do a series like this is because truly we need to have our lives founded on the truth of God's Word, don't we? We need to have our lives founded on the truth of God's Word, and when we read the Gospels, of Jesus, the encounters in the life of Jesus, many of our translations will have red letters, meaning those are the words that Jesus spoke. And uh, there are times where maybe we think Jesus said something, right? Or, man, I wish Jesus would have said this, or maybe I would have said this in that moment type of thing. And so without really digging in or investigating, reading the Bible for ourselves, We assume this is something Jesus said, don't we? We've done that before. We think, you know what, this is, sounds like close to what Jesus said, even though maybe he really didn't say. And so um, I did some deep investigation and I came up with some things that I am 100% confident Jesus did not say. All right, so follow along with me. These are for sure things that Jesus did not say. He did not say, come follow me. And nobody's going to fight in the car on the way to church. All right, Jesus did not say that. He did not say, blessed are you if you wear really fancy clothes to church, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not say that. Jesus did not say you should forgive only if they apologize. He did not say that. Jesus did not say, if you really loved me, you would share that post on Facebook. He did not say that, I promise you, all right? Jesus did not say, tolerate others as I have tolerated you. He didn't say, after confirmation, you guys are good to go, all right? He didn't say that. And finally, he did not say, take up your cross on Sundays and any other time it's convenient. Those are things I'm confident Jesus did not say. So this is the final message in our series, things Jesus didn't say. And uh, I want to encourage you to go back, if you missed any of the previous messages in this series, to go back and listen to them. They're fantastic. Pastor August kicked things off. His title was, God will never give you more than you can handle. Then Pastor Kerry with, follow your heart. Then last week, Pastor Jeff, God wants you to be happy. And tonight, the final one is, you deserve, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. Things Jesus did not say. Uh, There are modern proverbs that kind of go along with this, you get what you deserve thought or mindset. And so finish this with me if you know it. What goes around comes around. Got it. Your past is going to come back to haunt you. You made your bed. Now you have to sleep in it or lay in it. You're right. All right. Now there's probably some of us that somewhat enjoy this concept, this thought of you get what you deserve. In fact, actually, I'm guessing I'm the only one that does this. Nobody here thinks like this at all. You are way more holy than me, but there's a part of me when I'm driving down the road and I'm a law-abiding citizen, or maybe just a few miles an hour over, okay? But either way, I'm going pretty close to the speed limit. And this moment actually even happened to me this morning on the way to church. But you're driving the speed limit or close. And someone flies past you, like they're setting a land speed record, all right? How many of you have had these moments before? Instantly, and even this morning, I began to look, where is the officer? Where is the police officer? You're looking on the side roads, up ahead. You're like, somebody has to pull this person over. They need a ticket. You know, you're thinking of that. And uh, I'm, like I said, none of you think this, it's just me. But when, when you do pull up, and hopefully that does happen, like in your heart, you're like, I really hope this happens. You kind of hopefully 
the, you know, a few blocks down the road, they're pulled over, the officer is there, they're talking, and you're just hoping for the chance to make eye contact with the driver, right? Like, you give them a look like, I told you, I told you, you had it coming. I got what I deserve. I wasn't speeding. You got what you deserve, right? Anybody else thought, like, thought that before, all right? Come on. Okay, I'm the only one. But why do we think this? Think of this. Why do we think that Jesus said this? Well, life is full of transactions. We work and we get paid. We use that money and we buy food or coffee, a house, a student. They'll study hard and they get rewarded for their studies, right? A student does not study hard, does not put in the time and effort, and they get the consequences for that. Um, a lot of times I have prayed either a, for my kids or other students when they have a big test coming up, I say, God, re reward them for the time they spent studying. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Like, listen, if you didn't put in the effort, you're probably going to get what you deserve. But it's, so it's no wonder that we think we get what we deserve. This is how we operate in life. We tend to view life this way, that our actions lead to consequences or our actions lead to rewards. Nemesis. It is a belief by the Greek gods or Greeks long ago. This is a Greek god, Nemesis, that when a person did something wrong, immediately the Greek god Nemesis was on that person's trail and sooner or later caught up to that person and there was retribution for the evil and wrong that was done. Karma is a, a common belief and the Hindus believe that in reincarnation, so karma is basically based on how you live your life right now will determine what type of life you have in the next life. All right. Uh, so if you're living a good life now, karma will be good and you'll have a, even a better life or vice versa. The opposite happens. So we take this mindset and we place it on to Jesus and we assume this is how he operated. But how many of you know Jesus operated by a different set of rules? Jesus did not live this way. And so I have two thoughts about this tonight that I want to share with you. Just two quick thoughts. The first one is this, is that God is just. All right. God is just. The Bible does tell us that we reap what we sow. We understand this. So in Galatians chapter six, I wanna start in verse seven. Tonight I'm reading from the NASB. And this is what it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption or in the NIV it says destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So when we do wrong, when we sin, we suffer consequences of our actions, don't we? We've all experienced this before. Let me give you an example. You rob a bank, you're going to serve time. You sin against a loved one, they may forgive you, but the scars remain. God forgives the sin, but he doesn't overlook the consequence of the, of the sin. Let me give you an example. In, Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, all right, perfect example. They had this environment in the garden that was perfect. Nothing was wrong. There's no sin. And they chose to disobey God's command, didn't they? We read about it. And God was just by opening up their eyes to see their nakedness and their shame. And they were given consequences for their sins. This happened to Adam and Eve. God banished them from the perfect garden. So in this life, sin will yield negative consequences. It, it's bound to happen. But listen to me, I firmly believe that God can use those consequences to point us back to him, doesn't he? And you can all share stories of moments maybe that's happened to you or to someone that you love. God uses those moments in to, to help us realize our need for him. The prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, perfect example. The son wasted his father's inheritance right? And he, he had all this money and then drained the bank account on his selfish living, his sinful living. And he ended up working with the pigs. He's feeding the pigs. And you, want, you know the story, but he's facing the consequences of his actions. And he was reminded of the goodness of his dad, of his father, and it causes him to go home. He's just praying, maybe, maybe I can just be a servant, a slave for my dad. And obviously we know the rest of the story that the father embraces him, welcomes him back into, his, into the family. Think of this, God likewise, he uses the consequences of our sins to draw us back to the father. So that God is just, all right? Don't get me wrong, God is just. Because God is just, 
he cannot overlook sin, but because God is merciful, he made a, re a way of redemption through Jesus. So Jesus did not say, you get what you deserve. In fact, Jesus showed us multiple times by how he lived and what he said, the exact opposite. And he showed the power and redeeming and love of his father. And I wanna share some examples with you. So the first thought was God is just. The second thought is this, God is our redeemer. God is our redeemer. A, a redeemer is someone who buys back. They win back. They free that which is causing harm or guilt. They release from blame or guilt. And so when you hear the word redeemed or redeemer, that is what it's talking about. Let me give you some examples from Jesus' life. Zacchaeus, all right? If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have your Bible. But Zacchaeus, perfect example. I want to read this story. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. He, meaning Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Let me pause there for a moment. He, the reason he got rich is because he upcharged a lot of money from the normal people, the regular people. And so he got rich off of basically stealing from the poor people. So that's why he was not a well-liked person. Verse three, Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass the way through. How many of you have the song going through your head right now, by the way, okay, all right. <laughs> When Jesus came to the place in verse five, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down and come down, or hurry and come down for today. I must stay at your house. And he hurried and he came down and he received him gladly. When they, meaning the other people around, the religious leaders, the Jews, when they saw it, they all began to grumble saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So they're judging Jesus' actions because they knew who Zacchaeus was. In verse eight, Zacchaeus stopped and he said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, and imagine at that moment, people were like, yeah, yeah, me, you defrauded me. I'll give back four times as much. There's a heart change that's taken place here. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. We can talk a lot about this story, but I want you to notice one thing in verse 10. Jesus did not say for the son of man came to seek and save those who deserve it by their good works. He did not say that, all right? Another example in John chapter eight, starting in verse one. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and he began to teach. The scribes and the Pharisees, they brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger, he wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking, he straightened up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So then he goes back down and begins to write in the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Verse 10, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, nobody, Lord. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. We could talk a lot about this story as well, but I want you to notice Jesus did not say, go now, leave your life of sin, pay your fine to the courts and make me a meal. And then you'll deserve what I just did for you. Jesus didn't act like that. He didn't say anything like that. He didn't treat her like that. Another example, Paul, formerly known as Saul, he persecuted Christians. He punished them. He forced them to blaspheme. The Bible says that he was furiously enraged at Christians. He would travel to foreign cities to hunt them down. Needless to say, this is the guy that if you were a Christ follower before he met Jesus, you did not want to encounter, did you? Paul. 
So in Acts chapter 9, I want to read this story to you, and starting in verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he's asking for letters from the synagogues, uh, to, to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anybody belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was motivated to persecute these Christians. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Verse 7, the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he couldn't see anything. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, get up. Go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying, and he has seen in the vision you, a man named Ananias, come in and lay your hands on him so that he can regain his sight. In verse 13, Ananias responds like this, Lord, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias was probably like us. But in verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Before we get all judgy on Ananias, we all would be in the same boat, wouldn't we, if we were there? We would be like, first of all, I'm not going near that guy because he has the authority to arrest me and kill me. Nope, not going to do it. Or secondly, we would be thinking, this guy? You're kidding me, right? This guy deserves to be punished just like he's punished all the other followers of the way. This guy deserves to be stoned just like he approved the stoning of Stephen. This guy, after all that he's done, no way. He does not deserve it. But we don't see that example from God, do we? Jesus met him, changed his life. The exact opposite happened, and we know the rest of the story. God used Paul mightily in the book of Acts, in the rest of the New Testament, in those letters to the churches. Think about this. When Jesus encountered people that had sin in their life, he did not write them off because they, quote, deserved it. Instead, he showed them grace. He redeemed them. And in one of the most difficult moments of his earthly life. Jesus showed the exact opposite of this mindset of you get what you deserve. So turn with me in Luke chapter 23 in your Bible. We'll get there in just a moment. But in Luke chapter 23, it tells us of the crucifixion, of the death, and the burial of Jesus. So just like Pastor Luke shared this morning, crucifixion was horrible. All right, we can't even fathom what it was like. It was painful shameful. It was a brutal way to die. So crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals. It wasn't just for someone who maybe did a couple bad things uh, and got forced the the worst way of dying. Uh, This was reserved for the worst of the worst. Okay. It was painful, shameful. And in Luke chapter 23, picking up in verse 32, They're already on the cross, and it says two others also who are criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And the cast lots dividing up his garments among themselves. The gospel of Matthew used uh, the word robbers to describe criminals. The word robbers in the Greek means one who uses violence to rob openly. So this wasn't somebody who would sneak into a house and take something and a little knickknack and then sneak out and nobody saw it. It's, it's very likely that these two people, these gentlemen that were on the cross next to Jesus, were accused of, you know, armed robbery, possibly with murder. Who knows? But whatever it is, it was, it deserved capital punishment. They deserved it. I think it's safe to say that these guys weren't just pickpocketers, all right? They deserved horrible, 
a painful death just like it was. And I want you to notice something. Jesus isn't praying, okay? Jesus could have said, I deserve to be free. I don't deserve this. Jesus didn't say that either, but Jesus is praying. He didn't pray, God, send your angels, do exactly what they've done to me. He didn't say, God, send your angels, give them all the boils that you can on their body because they deserve it. These two criminals witnessed the prayer of Jesus. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jumping ahead to verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him. He says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked him and said, don't you even fear God? Since you're under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed are suffering just, justly, excuse me, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He recognized who Jesus was. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said a powerful prayer, a powerful word spoken to this criminal. He says, today, truly, I say to you, you'll be with me in paradise. The second criminal, he recognized he deserved the punishment, but yet he's asking for mercy. The words of Jesus, the response of Jesus. Listen, this is one of the most difficult moments of his earthly life and ministry. And Jesus' response is powerful. He does not say, join the church. He doesn't say, say a prayer, pay your tithe. He doesn't say, get off the cross and do community service hours. He doesn't say all of that. And then I'll remember you in my kingdom. He doesn't say, buddy, you had your chances. I remember you when I divided the, the, you know, multiplied the loaves and fish. I remember you, you were in the back of the crowd, you weren't paying attention, you were hanging out and just, you know, not worried about that, you just wanted the free food. He doesn't say that, he doesn't say, I remember you when I was at the Sermon on the Mount and I was preaching and you could care less, you were just there because your parents made you go there. Jesus does not respond to that at all. He doesn't say, after all that you've done, I cannot forgive that. Jesus looks at this guilty, sinful, but repentant person and, and says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. This guy, think about this guy, this guy, this criminal would never be able to repay this gift. Never. He would never be able to apologize to those that he had wronged. He was about to die. He's never able to do any more good onto this earth. He's never going to be able to get baptized, to volunteer at his church, anything like that. This guy would never be able to do another single thing to earn right standing with God. All he did was come to faith in Jesus. All he did was surrender to Jesus. This criminal says, I deserve this. I deserve this death. You don't, but I do. And think about this. He recognized Jesus was king, that he was king of another kingdom. He recognized that. And in that moment, he was redeemed. In that moment, on the cross, moments away from dying, he's redeemed. He's rescued from eternal separation from God. He was given what he did not deserve, and that was salvation. That's what he was given. In that moment, he was adopted into the family of God, into the kingdom of God. Jesus did not interview this man to find out his credentials, his resume. He didn't do any of that. He saw the heart of this man. Salvation is about receiving, not earning. It's not about getting what you deserve. It's about receiving what you cannot earn and you do not deserve. That is salvation through Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, it says, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. This is all of us here, all right? Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved. Think about this. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. True? He didn't come to just make us a better person. He came to redeem us, to rescue us from a life that of separation from him. That's how good God is. And it's by his grace that we are saved. I heard a, a pastor one time give this illustration. Imagine if this second criminal, all right, he hears the words of Jesus. 
you're forgiven, you can, you can go. And somehow, miraculously, he gets down off the cross, all right? He heals from the wounds that he just incurred. Uh, once that happens, this guy has a story to tell, doesn't he? Just imagine for a moment, he has a powerful story to tell. What do you think his life is devoted to, right? He's devoted to what the innocent, innocent man did for him. Every day he would remember what happened. He would never forget. This would change him forever. This man would be fully devoted to Jesus. Why? Because of the free gift that was given to him. Because he deserved death, but he was given life. He was redeemed by Jesus. And my question to all of us here tonight is this. Is that how we're living? Is that how we're living? Because we have been given a free gift. We have been redeemed and we have been set free. We have been rescued and saved and redeemed. Do we live like it? Can people tell that we've been redeemed because of Jesus? Because it, it should. His story is my story. The criminal story is my story. They said, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be up here and tell you about the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't deserve it. I've made way too many mistakes. My sin is too great. Truly, I'm not good enough. And before you get all judgy on me, his story is your story, right? You don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to do what you do because your sin is too great. You've made way too many mistakes. You're not good enough. But I'm so thankful that Jesus, the innocent one, did not give us what we deserve. Right? How many of you are grateful for that? We, we, we deserve it, guys. But because of Jesus, he died in our place. And he took, he took what I deserve so that I don't have to. He took what you deserve so that you don't have to. Here's the reality is that we all deserve death. We all deserve it. And I know we've heard this before, all right? Watching online or here in person, we, we've heard this before. We all deserve death death. That's what we chose through our sin. We willfully have chosen something other than God. We deserve by our own choice, death. But by God's grace, through the work of Jesus, we receive what we need and he takes and he took what we deserved. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so grateful that that happened. Pastor Brett, would you come to the piano? Psalm 103. It's a powerful psalm, and I encourage you to read it. If you, if you haven't, it's a great psalm. Read it again. It's powerful, powerful words of God's word. And I want to read from the NIV tonight, starting in verse 8. It says, The Lord is compassionate, and he's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He does not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us at our, as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Should we get what we deserve? Yes, you bet you. But through Jesus, we don't have to. I'm gonna read Galatians 6, 8 once again. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. Ultimately, guys, we do reap what we sow, right? The Bible says, hang on just a little bit longer. You're gonna reap what you sow. If we sow a life of sin, of unrepentance, of rebellion from to Jesus, we're gonna reap an eternal life in hell. It's reality. If we sow a life of repentance, of faithfully following Jesus, not perfection, but faithfully following Jesus, we're gonna reap an eternal life in heaven. So what is our response? Well, the most important one is this, is that we repent. We stop sowing into the sinful life, all right? We faithfully follow Jesus. We repent daily. Honestly, we need to daily thank Jesus for redeeming us. We need to daily thank Jesus for not treating us as our sins deserve, because truly we don't deserve it. 
And we need to help others understand what Jesus has done. So here's what I wanna do. We're gonna take a few moments to pray. And uh, the first thing is this, is that we're gonna pray for salvation. So if you're here in person or you're watching online and you would say, I need Jesus to redeem me. I need to give my life and my heart and my devotion to Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're gonna pray and I encourage you to join with me in prayer. But there's several of us here. In fact, all of us here should have at least one person that we know needs Jesus in their life. They're not following him. They're not serving him. So we're gonna pray that they would understand the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. That's what we're gonna pray for. And we're gonna take a few moments to thank God and thank Jesus for his redemption on the cross. I think just words of thank you and praise and worship and adoration is powerful. And then we'll close in, in, in a song. So if you're watching online, don't go away. Just in where you're at, at your house or, or in your living room, join us in prayer and then we'll come back to pray. So would you pray with me? You're welcome to find a place here at this altar. But Jesus, we thank you that you redeem. We thank you that you set free. And I, I pray right now for that person that needs you, that as they cry out to you from the depths of their hearts, Jesus, that you would set them free. Jesus, that you would redeem them, that you would flood their hearts with your power and your love. Break down those walls that are separating them from you, that they've built up the walls of sin. Lord, as they cry out to you, I pray that you would tear down those walls and that you would rush in, Lord, that they would see that not only are you just, but you are a redeemer. Lord, we do pray for our loved ones. We pray for our friends, our family members, neighbors. Jesus, you love them. You didn't just die for those who appear to have it all together and that are already serving you, but you died for the person who is a criminal that is deserving of death, of separation. And we lift them up to you right now. And we pray that your love and your power would invade their hearts, Jesus. Jesus, we cannot comprehend your love and your power, but we pray that you would do what you need to do to reach that person. For the son or daughter that has wandered away, for the grandson, granddaughter, a family member, a friend that has walked away from you, Lord, that they maybe have preconceived ideas of who you are and, and this whole Christianity thing, would you break down those stereotypes in the name of Jesus, that you would soften their heart to hear your spirit. It is your kindness that will lead them to repentance. I pray that true repentance will happen. Jesus, we thank you. Would you take just a few moments here in person or watching online and just thank Jesus for the redeeming love that he displayed on the cross. Just remember what your life was like before Jesus. If you're like me, you've been raised in the church most of your life. Imagine what it, it could be like if Jesus had not done what he did. Let that stir within your heart and, and just thank him. Jesus, thank you for redeeming me. Jesus, thank you for giving me grace and mercy. I do not deserve it. I have broken your law, your commandments. I have broken your heart. I have sinned. Jesus, I thank you that your love is so powerful. Beyond my comprehension, beyond anything that I can ever imagine, Jesus, your love invades hearts and takes over. And tonight we say thank you. Thank you for the grace that is so powerful. Thank you for your love that is so powerful that it reaches even to the worst of the worst. You've redeemed us. You have bought us back. You've won us back. You have paid the highest price 
for the salvation of every person. Jesus, help us to live like it. Help us to live a redeemed life that others would see within us, within our actions, within our words, a redeemed life. We thank you that you are just, but you use the consequences to draw us back to you. We thank you for that, that you love us. Jesus, we thank you. There's two scriptures that came to my mind that I want to share with you and ties in. Pastor Luke's message was wonderful this morning. If you missed it, um, go back and listen. But in Romans chapter 8, we're going to, I think we're starting Romans chapter 8 next week. Sorry, verse 1. Now think of the, the criminal, the, the thief, the, the robber on the cross. When he, when he decided to trust Jesus, think of this verse in, in light of him. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me or set him free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his own, uh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man. Amen. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I want to share this one before we leave. It says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this is the criminal, this is you and me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I can only imagine what that was like for that man on the cross next to Jesus moments away from dying, yet moments away from heaven. The change that happened is so powerful. So did Jesus say you get what you deserve? No. We do reap what we sow, but Jesus modeled a life completely opposite of that. And because of that, we should live a life that honors him, shouldn't we? A life that reflects the redeemed power that Jesus has done for us. Amen?